this webinar aims to provide you with an introduction to cell preparation and tubing for PGT. And we will introduce you to the equipment setup, the choice of micro tools, the methods used for cell preparation and tubing for PGT, as well as give you some troubleshooting tips. So this is the structure of the presentation. We will revisit quickly the PGT process again, then look at some general guidelines that are in state when doing cell preparation and tubing for PGT. We will focus on the real practical tube and dish preparation, then the tubing and storage itself. And then we will look at the real situation by I will talk you through the procedure while showing a video. And then we will talk and discuss some tips and tricks. And finally, we will summarize. So let's revisit the PGT process again. Patients who are undergoing pre-implantation genetic testing will need to undergo IVF or ICSI in order to produce embryos that are cultured until the blastocyst stage where trophectoderm cells are then being biopsed. These biopsed cells will then go into a tube and this tube will then be sent off to the genomics laboratory for testing. And this testing then will result into a report which will state which embryo is genetically normal. In the meantime, the embryos, the blastocysts, they will be vitrified until the analysis, the testing has been done and the report has been produced. And from this report, we will then be able to identify those embryos that are genetically healthy and those that we will then warm culture and transfer to our patient. And hopefully this then will result in a healthy pregnancy. Now today we are going to focus on the tubing process itself and I will guide you through that process step by step. But first of all, we need to discuss the general guidelines for that. The general guidelines when working with individual cells that are going to be tested for their DNA by an amplification technique of the DNA, of specific regions of that DNA, well, they are, this process is the most vulnerable for contamination with foreign DNA. And so that means that before we start working, we need to think really hard how we are going to do this and where we are going to do this tubing procedure. Ideally, you, ideally you have a separate room dedicated for the tubing, but this will not always be the case. So the working space that you are going to use, also if it's a separate room, of course, this could be a flow cabinet, and it should be cleaned in order to remove all sources of contamination, cells uh, from your skin or cells that come through the filter of the HEPA filter, even from the flow cabinet, DNA and RNA. All this needs to be cleaned away. Clean practice in the genetics lab requires prevention of contamination from human DNA and RNA. And there are specific products that can be used in the genetics lab. So these are ch chemical reagents that break down DNA and RNA. And in this way, we'll remove all traces of foreign uh, DNA that will not be amplified and that will not lead to a mosaic result. You can also use UV irradiation, but be aware it depends on the distance between your sample, I mean the uh, tubes or the uh, surface and the UV light the, what the effectiveness of that UV light will be. So at eight centimeters, it's only roughly 83%. And at 48 centimeters, the effectiveness is only 71%. Ethanol does not remove DNA and should not be used. So cleaning in a genetic lab is not the same as cleaning in an IVF lab. The products that the genetics labs use are also toxic for our oocytes, embryos, and sperm samples. So be careful. Do not use those specific products if you are going to do the tubing in your lab itself. Is, if that is the case, we advise you to clean the surfaces in your standard way and then rinse with DNA, RNA-free water afterwards to remove all traces of amplifiable DNA. The sample preparation and collection should be performed sorry, at room temperature because we want to avoid that the DNA degrades at uh, 37 degrees or even higher temperature. 
If you cannot set, switch off your heated stage in your flow cabinet, you could um, bring the working space, your working area to a higher level. And for example, the RI ambi plate is ideal to do that. So you will work at room temperature over the still heated surface, but it will be at room temperature. The collection tube rack should be placed during the tubing procedure on a cool block, again, to prevent that the DNA will degrade. And this cool block is not sterile, sterile or clean enough, so we will cover it with a sterile cloth. After the tubing, the sample rack that collects all the tubes is going to be sealed and stored in a freezer, again, to stabilize the DNA. And this will stay there until shipment. And shipment is also to be done on frozen ice packs. So clearly, you have to check really well with the genomics laboratory what the conditions are for your shipping as well. All cell sample movements require appropriate witnessing. So, and all these events needs to be recorded. You cannot make a mistake and tube cells of uh, embryo number one in a tube labeled number two. So make sure you have a robust witnessing, manual witnessing system in place at all the cell sample movements. Ensure that only the materials and forms from one patient are in that, in that working space. So don't mix up materials and documents from different patients. Again, to make sure that there is no mix up of cells or result outcomes. Now, how to go about this? We are going to prepare our tubes and dishes. And um, your genomic provider should give you, uh, offer you the, the buffer and the tubes. Now with uh, Cooper Genomics, we have the embryo biopsy kit that will contain, as you can see, a sample rack. It will contain the tubes that are DNA, RNA free, and it will contain the buffer. It will also contain the labels with a barcode, and these labels and barcode are unique for that specific biopsy kit. The rack is also DNA RNA free, but check with your provider uh, what uh, buffer you should use if they do not supply you with a buffer. We will take out the tubes, put them in a rack, a maximum of five we will take out of our sample uh, bag, and we will close them immediately, put them in this uh, sample rack. And then we will add two microliters of the buffer into the tubes and we will close them and keep them there on the cool block until we are doing the tubing. We will also place the barcode and the label on the tube just to make sure that this is from uh, the specific patient. Now we need to prepare our washing drops and for this we ideally you take a four well dish uh, we have the four well GPS is from Life Global that also has numbered wells. And in each well, we will introduce 20 microliters of the buffer. So each well will contain a washing drop of the sample. The sample will then be moved later on through these drops. This dish is a unique dish for each embryo. So it's a freshly prepared dish. When it is prepared, you close as well uh, you cover it because we don't want evaporation. This is done at room temperature. So never reuse these drops, never reuse the dishes. Make sure also that the dish comes from a fresh sleeve in order to avoid contamination of foreign DNA and RNA. So we have our washing dish. We have our tube with the two microliters of buffer on a cold block. Let's now take our sample. And this is our sample dish. This, uh, the biopsy dish has the sample in drop number two. It has the name of the patient and the embryo number. We will write the same here, the name of the patient and the embryo number. And then we are going to move the sample from the biopsy dish to the uh, washing dish. For, for this, we will take a handling pipette and we will prime it first with the buffer. And then we will take the sample and move it to drop number one. After that, we will expel the medium, take fresh medium, take the sample and move it to drop number two. We will expel the medium. We take medium, fresh medium from drop number three, take the sample and move it to three and so on. 
After this final wash drop in four, we will take the sample and we will bring it in the tube. This volume of buffer with the sample for going to the tube is not more than uh, half 0.5 microliter of the buffer. So how do we do that? We have our uh, Petri dish. We will put our tube uh, in an angle in this Petri dish. You can also use the cover uh, of the Petri dish to put the tube. We will focus um, first on the sample in the drop aspirated with 0.5 microliter of buffer and then we will move the dish and focus on the tube on the bottom of the tube and bring our pipette in there and deposit the sample at the bottom of the tube we will close the tube write the embryo number on the top and on the label and a witness will make sure that we are, have uh, labeled the correct number on that tube we we'll record this as well and after that, we will then quickly centrifuge the sample. We will store it and freeze it in the sample rack box. Okay, let's now look how this will work in practice. And I will guide you through the steps while watching a recorded video. So before you start, you have to make sure, as I said, that the area is cleaned, that all the equipment you use in there is clean is DNA RNA free and only dedicated to, to uh, tubing. We will also have to wear protective personal equipment, surgical gown, a mask, gloves, as you can see, uh, non-powdered non gloves, sterile gloves, and we have to cover all our skin because the skin could contaminate um, the, tubing, the tube cells. Here we are putting a sterile cloth over the cool block we are taking the sample rack box from the embryo biopsy kit. All this is DNA RNA free, so we can touch that with our sterile gloves. Now, I'm, this way, I pushed away the box. The outside of the box, of course, is not clean, so I use a sterile cloth to move it. Here, we take out the sample rack box, put a plastic bag behind it, and we will open it, and here we find our buffer. We will take out the buffer that we will use for the washing and the tubing. We will check the lot number and the expiry date and record all that on the biopsy workshop. Here, of course, it's the witness who is recording this on the biopsy worksheet. Then we will take out a maximum of five tubes. We will close the tube back and then we will close those tubes immediately and put them in the rack. We will label the tubes and for the Cooper Genomics labels, there is also a barcode. So that label uh, needs to go as high as possible on the tube and ending with the barcode. We also give one of the labels to our uh, colleague who will then stick this to our, the worksheet. So we are sure that the ID is the same on the tubes as on our paperwork, our worksheet. Now we're going to prepare the tubes. We are going to add two microliters of buffer. For this, we use, of course, also tips that are DNA RNA free. And these tip boxes are only dedicated for the tubing work. So one by one, we will add two microliters of the tubing fluid and we will close immediately the tube after we have introduced the buffer. When that is done, we will start preparing our washing dish. And for this, we will record the name of the patient on that dish and the embryo number. And we will then add 20 microliters of the buffer in each of the wells. This is a unique dish for that specific embryo. So for each embryo, we make a fresh dish immediately be prepared before we do the tubing. Now we are taking our biopsy dish itself. 
we prime the pipettes and we will transfer the sample from droplet number two to the first washing drop. We keep on monitoring through the stereo microscope and we try to avoid make, to make any bubbles because that is, will make life much more complicated when moving the, the sample. So we expel the content or the excess content. We will take fresh medium from the next drop and then we will move back to our sample. We will aspirate the sample. and then flush it out. We will expel again the excess medium and take fresh medium from the next drop. And in this way, we will continue to move the sample, to wash the sample through these four drops. Try to avoid to, to take oil uh, from the biopsy dish through the washing steps because oil might interfere with the amplification of the DNA. So now we have the sample in the pipette with 0 0.5 microliter of buffer. We are focusing now on the tip of the uh, tube and we will introduce the pipette and deposit the sample in this two microliter of buffer. We will check flush the pipette to see if the sample has been removed. And then we will write the number of the embryo on the tube and on the label as well. And the witness will check this and re will record all other important uh, items like the number of cells, the quality of this specific embryo and so forth. We will then quickly spin these uh, tubes in a mini centrifuge, place them in the tube rack close the tube rack so that the sample the tube sample doesn't move and then we will write the name of the patient and the date of birth on that specific box the witness of course will double check that this is correct and then we will introduce and pack the box and this one that will go to the freezer. So now let's finalize with the tips and the tricks. So things can go wrong, unfortunately, and the cells could have been lost at the time of the tubing. So what does that mean that we need to rebiopsy? So we need to take a second biopsy from that specific embryo. Just make sure that the tubing is performed before you vitrify the embryos, because once these embryos are vitrified, you need to warm them, culture them, and rebiopsy again, so that's extra stress. So the second biopsy can be taken through the same opening of the zona pellucida, or you can make a new, a second opening and uh, perform the second biopsy from there. You could use a deleted PVP, diluted PVP to avoid losing cells during the moving and the washing. But this is more, I find that it's more an experience uh, thing. In the beginning, you could use diluted PVP, but if you are really experienced, the PVP is absolutely not necessary. Samples could be very sticky. And this is the case when there is cell lysis in the sample. And then, of course, uh, this could result in, a, uh, uh, in losing of cells as well because they will stick into your pipette. And this goes back to the quality of the biopsy itself. Now, it is also possible that the PGT report will say there is no result, so no amplification, no result for that specific sample. Again, here the embryos have been vitrified, so they need to be warmed, rebiopsed, and uh, uh, samples sent off for the testing again, and then they need to be revitrified. So that's extra stress. The same way to, uh, uh, to take the second biopsy, go through the same opening, or make a second hole and perform the second biopsy over there. 
The embryo can be hatched before embryo transfer in these cases because the risk of two openings is there. And so twinning might be a possibility for that specific embryo or could stay stuck into the zona pellucida. Another important aspect of uh, our tubing is the mosaicism. Now, first, we need to explain what the difference is between true mosaicism and, uh, and artifactual mosaicism. Mosaicism means that at some point the embryo has made a mistake and there are two different types of cells um, in the embryo. So mitosis went wrong for one group of cells. So this will then uh, result in a mixture of healthy and aneuploid cells or a, a mixture of different type of aneuploid cells from that specific embryo. So that, that is true mosaicism originating from the embryo itself. Artifactual mosaicism is actually contamination. It's a, uh, it's a mosaicism created because we have cells from the embryo and they are mixed with foreign cells, foreign DNA. And that DNA will, of course, also amplify. But in the testing result, we cannot see the difference between these uh, artifactual or true mosaicism. But we can prevent this artifactual mosaicism. And one is the contamination, the risk of contamination from the previous embryo. So we really advise you to change the biopsy pipettes, to change the handling pipettes, and to use fresh uh, flushing and washing media and biopsy dishes as well for each specific embryo. The result could also be uh, of poor quality, and then this will result in, in a noisy result. And that's also, again, artifactual. And most of the time, this comes because of excessive laser use. As explained before, in some in the all, older, uh, the first uh, amplification systems, the sperm DNA could also have been amplified, and that again would then be a pattern of contamination. Now, the system that Cooper, uh, Genomics PGTAI 2O uses, there the pattern of DNA will not be amplified. But please check with your genomic provider if this is the case, if you can do IVF or do you, uh, if you have to do exclusively ICSI. Maternal contamination is also possible. We discussed that. The cumulus cells who are remaining on the zona pellucida and they could end up in your biopsy pipette together with the sample. So make sure that you do thorough denudation and that you check visually if there are any cumulus cells left, left at the time of the biopsy. And we, the operators, we can contaminate as well. You have to wear this personal protective equipment, the gloves, the surgical gown, um, uh, the mask, the cap. So you should try to avoid to contaminate with skin cells at any point. But just make sure that you don't panic through all these procedures. There's always a solution. So we always advise as well to work with two operators, two embryologists, one who is doing the biopsy and the other person is doing the tubing. They can both witness each step. They can both check and advise or do troubleshooting at the time itself. So yeah, don't panic. There's always a solution and you can always contact us as well. Okay, so let's summarize. Trophectoderm biopsy for PGT requires a high blastocyst development rate, an optimized culture system, and excellent vitrification program. If not, your PGT outcomes will be negative, negatively impacted. It may require changes in your laboratory flow and also in the use of the equipment. So you need to foresee uh, an extra space and a clean space, an uninterrupted space, where you will do your tubing whilst uh, the biopsying is going on. Installation of high quality equipment is therefore also necessary. You need good aspiration systems. You need a good laser. You need to have good uh, handling pipette system and so on. A good stereo microscope is also key to visualize the sample. It is possible that you have to do your biopsy procedures at different time points or days even, but this is something you need to decide within your group, in your team, how and when you will do those biopsy procedures.
a robust witnessing system in all steps of the biopsying and cell preparation uh, steps is key. It's really very important to avoid mix-up or a wrong diagnosis. Training is really mandatory. And this is key for both biopsying as for cell sampling preparation and tubing. Training, the initial training for cell sampling and tubing, you can buy uh, beads that have the same size as blastomeres, so you can start by moving those around and see if the tubing uh, is successful. Of course, you cannot test if there is amplification. Another uh, possibility is to, um, uh, if, you, if that is possible within your clinic where patients donate material, of course, you have to have an informed consent from them and it needs to be traceable which embryos or unfertilized oocytes or whatever you used for that initial training and validation step. Ongoing competency assessment is also key. And both biopsy and cell sampling, you need to keep on checking with you by uh, uh, analyzing those key performance indicators if you yourself and your colleagues are working still at the same quality. The quality of the biopsy technique will affect the PGT result and also the viability of the embryo. So it is really uh, important that you stay up to date as well with new techniques or new changes that might come along. So thank you for uh, listening to this and watching the slides. I'm now uh, open for taking questions.